Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us for this executive conversation. And I, can you can tell that this is well subscribed. The team has been excited to, to hear from you. And Tamika, there's one thing that the Economic Club of Washington loves, and that is a hometown hero. Am I right? So think of this. Born and raised in St. Mary's County, on to Mount St. Mary's for your undergraduate. <laughs> I said, yes, we, we are represented. And, and then a law degree from the University of Maryland and an MBA from University of Baltimore. 26 years, then ultimately becoming the managing principal for Deloitte here in the Washington office. How does it feel to be back home? Wow. Oh, yeah, we've got Deloitte. Isn't that fantastic? But the other thing that the Economic Club of Washington loves is a newsmaker. And can I ask, we've, we've read the news that on April 1st, the, uh, the collective bargaining agreement of the National Basketball Players Association was tentatively confirmed. And uh, do you have any news you can share with us today? She's, she's channeling her inner David here. So, <laughs> so first of all, it is so good to be home. I hadn't appreciated. I was sort of filled when I walked in here and I saw familiar faces. So thank you for being here. And thank you for the, the timing could not be better. And I do want to apologize for those of you who were planning to come last week. We averted a disaster last week by pushing it to this week. So I am so grateful for that. So thank you. News. So so my chief of staff, Inky, said I couldn't say anything about um, the CBA, but because this is for David and the Economic Club, I will say what I'm most excited about is our players' ability to invest. And that was a really big deal for me. I feel like that was a game changer. It was a big deal for our guys. They really wanted to make sure that they were creating generational wealth. And so while we'll be going through regulatory issues and concerns around how we can invest in PE firms that invest in teams, that's a big deal. It's a game changer. It hasn't been done in any other sport. So I'm really excited about that. Fantastic. Folks. Uh, Tamika, uh, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of going behind the scenes with the collective bargaining and, you know, what it takes to negotiate in an environment like this. But I really want to start with you. You know, here you were a consultant in Washington, D.C., and one day the phone rings, and it's an invitation for this position, which you took in, in January of 2022. But how did you react when you got that phone call? And, and what, what was it about your career that prepared you for the opportunity? Yeah, that's a great question. I, first, I will say I had no intention on leaving a place that I loved. I loved Deloitte and our partners there. And so it was not something that I was actively pursuing. And in fact, though, I, I know many of you have probably read The Alchemist, where they talk about when you know something, you want something, the whole world conspires to make that happen. And that's sort of how I felt, because to be quite honest, they had begun the search prior to COVID. And I would have never considered it at that time. But then I watched, obviously, when George Floyd occurred and all of the things that our players were doing around social activism. And here we were. The, the actual search had been pushed off. And so then it came at a time when I was actually eligible to retire. And so I retired actually from Deloitte in January of last year. And I felt like I would have the opportunity to do something that was to me serve my purpose. And that's really what I wanted to do. I thought I have less days left in my life than I had before me. And I wanted to make sure that I was spending it in a way that was more meaningful to me. I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper on this because I am totally with you on this incredible power of having a vision, knowing what you want and allowing yourself to want something. What is it that you wanted to give back? So I really thought, you know, going to school at Mount St. Mary's and Dave um, also there too, we, we were taught sort of to lead a life of significance where you were serving your purpose. And I thought it was critical that I had learned so much at Deloitte and in my, my career. And I really wanted to take everything that I had learned in the business world and now apply it in a different setting. And so historically, as you all know, typically the NBPA was led, like most unions, by a lawyer. And they were looking for something on the next generation where it was 
business. And they thought, wow. And as I tell people often, 27 years ago, people weren't doing a JD MBA. You actually went to law school to avoid the numbers. And here we were. <laughs> and so the reality was that this was an opportunity to bring that to the floor. And so for me, it was just the timing could not have been better. That's fantastic. Well, let's Jeremy's like, I'm not sure the timing was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go inside the Players Association then and, and give us a little bit of your view of what the association is like. Some people now describe it as uh, the, the, the basketball is a player's game. Yes. And, and so I'd like to hear you know, what you've seen and learned of these players, uh, both, yes, in their profession, but a little bit of the, the life around them. Yeah, so it is a very unique environment. And I'll start by saying, you know, it has dawned on me in being in this role that many people don't know what the MBPA is. Many people think the NBA is the players. And the reality is it is not. The NBA are the owners. They are the marketing machine that is running basketball and operations. The MBPA are the players. We are the Steph Currys, the LeBrons, the Malcolm Brogdons of the world. That's who we are. And so from my perspective, I have the opportunity to protect, support, and amplify our players. So in this setting, I get to serve that purpose, but I'm also really focused on how we are growing the pie, not only for the league more broadly, but how we're growing the pie for our players. So if you think about us now as the owners, you also have to consider that we, when we think about our house, we have our foundation, who Steph Stephanie Rawlings Blake now runs our foundation. We have the W, which we is led by Terry Jackson, and so we support that as well as the next generation of players. So that what we call the G League, that's part of our players. But then we also have this commercial arm, which we call Think 450. And I am the CEO and chairman of the board for Think 450, and that's where we are actually out selling our group licensing. And so when you think about that in the 2Ks of the world and Nike and all of those things, that's our business. So we are running almost a billion dollar organization on top of the fact that we have a union that is looking out for protecting and supporting our players as well. Hey, let's, let's pause on this moment for just a minute because I think our workforce is probably the biggest issue in this uh, moment of economic development in the United States, right? How do you attract and retain talent? And Tamika, I think we have a lot to learn from you about how you think about the whole ecosystem around the person. You have an athlete who's a star. You have an athlete whose actual you know, physicality is the asset uh, that is coming. And yet, these are human beings who maybe will play for a short period of time and then need to, to interact with the broader world. Um, tell me how you're thinking about player development and, and how the MBPA then plays a role in cultivating that talent. Yeah, so, you know, it is much more holistic, I think, than people typically think of it, right? I think, first of all, our players are the most recognized. They don't wear helmets, they don't have hats, so people know who they are. And so when you talk about it being a player's league, that's part of the reason why that happens, is because people know who they are. Their social media presence rivals many of the Fortune 500, right? So if LeBron tweets something or says something, it's as powerful as, you know, some of our organizations doing it and the impact that they have is significant. It's also really important to think about how they're being developed. I think we take things for granted. They are the best athletes in the world, no question, right? But what you have to also consider is that they have been focused so much on performing for so long that this is now a new element where they're looking at image and exposure. And he, everyone knows at Deloitte, I talk so much about this pie, performance, image, and exposure. I thought I would never use it in this world because clearly they have all of those things. But the reality is they have not had the exposure to things that you would take for granted that they would. So in our first All-Star last year, we really spent time giving them, making sure that they were exposed. So I said, we're gonna have a dinner and we're gonna invite Robert Kraft and Michael Rubin and David Solomon and 
Joe from our firm, and we're going to sit down and talk about what it means to create generational wealth, what it means when the ball stops bouncing, right? We have player programs within our office, so we're making sure that we are doing like broadcast university, as you see, many of them become, you know, broadcasters afterwards. Many of them invest in real estate. So we have to make sure that we're honing in on those things as well. And being exposed to these business titans is a game changer for them, because those are things that they hadn't imagined before that now are considerations for when their time period is over. The average age is 4.9 years to 14. Don't ask me about that. From an economic perspective, it makes no sense. But that is exactly the reality. And so what that means is after five years, everyone thinks, oh, they make so much money. But the reality is, if you weren't playing after five years, how are you going to live the rest of your life? So you've got to think about this very differently than what I think people are accustomed to them thinking about. And they are such amazing men. It is such a privilege to really serve in this role. I tell people all the time that it's about their and. And so on day one with them, I recognize, partly because I have two boys of my own, and one of them has his whole room plastered with Steph Curry pictures. And I said, you know, he's probably not going to go to the NBA, but Steph does so much much more than just play basketball. It's important that they learn about these individuals. So when I think about Malcolm Brogdon, I think about him as a philanthropist. I think about the things that he does in Africa where he's doing clean water. I think about him as a father, as a husband. Those are the ands, right? I want us to start telling the story about what's their and, and I want to ask our kids what is their and. So when I was talking to Strauss Zelnick, who is the CEO of 2K, I said, he was like, what can I do for you? I said, I want you to show our players differently. I think when you go into the game, I've learned a lot about the game lately, but when you go into the game, you really are just thinking about them on the court. I said, why don't you talk about C.J. McCollum and his vineyard? Why don't you talk about the fact that his wife is a dentist and a professional and she has her own career? Start to build those things in because I want kids to reimagine things very differently. That is so exciting. Um, I love <laughs> the potential, right? This, this is the new angle you're bringing. And folks, I would say, you know, as we think about this as members of the Economic Club of Washington, think about the role we play in the lives of people who work with and for us. And uh, something that I talk about with people is the work-life blend. Mm -hmm. The work-life blend. You know, there is no perfect work-life balance. And I think a lot of people in this room want to know how you do it all. I want to know, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, when you were first talking, the imposter syndrome was coming in on me. I was like, I don't know who she is talking about. But I will also say that it is a work-life blend, right? Because I think you can have many things. You just can't have them all at once. And you know, in spite of the success, I think, that we had on the CBA, you also have to think about kind of what it means. And in my world, I still live here in Maryland, and I still love Maryland. Today was a good example. It was 85 degrees, and it was raining in New York. And oh, it's, it's like this every day. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, gosh, it's no big deal. As you know, my partners will tell you, we work so hard during the week. We work on the weekends too. But the reality is, my family wasn't, you know, it, I didn't think it'd be a big shift to live in New York during the week because they didn't see me much during the week anyway. And that I would be home on the weekends. And the reality is when we were in the you know, heat of CBA, like I didn't come home and I had a son who is in his last year of high school. And so when I look around and I hear all the things he's doing, I'm so sad that I'm like, gosh, I'm missing this, you know, because those things are important. And he told someone recently that it was fine that I was gone during the week because he has a busy schedule. He's a very busy pro bass fisherman. <laughs> and that it really didn't make a difference. But the reality, it made a difference to me. And I, I do feel that same strain. I know that both men and women feel when you aren't there. Yeah. He invited someone to the prom recently and he told me that he was in the parking lot drawing on a poster board that he ran into Staples to get to bring it in to ask her to the prom. I was like, what? I thought I would have bedazzled that and put some fur on it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it was probably a good thing you weren't home. <laughs>
I, I love it. Have you given any thought to actually moving the headquarters from New York to Washington, D.C.? I think D. that would be it. D did it, I right? mean, right? There are, yes. there, are things that, there are things that Washington offers. I mean, for instance, um, you know that gym above the Supreme Court? Yes. They call it the highest court in the land. Yes. Wouldn't that be a great uh, spot? For yes, I think that would be a great okay, spot. Okay, we'll talk. We'll yes. talk afterwards. I love that. But, but, but let's come back now to the subject of the CBA because there is so much interest in it. And folks, you can go online and you can see all kinds of things written about this agreement. Um, 2017 was the last CBA that was established, and then though that was extended. I didn't know, was that extended because because of you? Was it extended because you were new to the role? No, in fact, I wish it had been, but no. <laughs> um, in fact, and I tried, I share this with people because I think it really is important. This was our opt-out year, so this is year six. The reality is the CBA went through the 23-24 season. So I know there was lots of excitement and anxiety over this opt-out period, but the reality was our players were fine with where it was. So yes, for my perspective, I wanted to get this done, but I not as much as the league wanted to get this done, right? And so I didn't feel the same tug to have to make this happen or to give up things that our players really wanted because you know we had to get this done. And so I think to some extent that was an advantage. Another part of it though is that I, I came at it very differently, right? I came at it from a business perspective as opposed to the legal perspective. So I was thinking about Okay, what is this going to mean for them with their pension? What is this going to mean for them from a privacy perspective? So it takes some time to reimagine how things would be. And as you can imagine, nobody wanted to sort of scratch it all up and start all over again. I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. We have matching principles in accounting, right? But those things are things that we have to think about and, and sort of consider. So, but I think all in all, we are glad we are where we are. We have a big media deal coming up. So, you know, this does sort of clear it so that we can see where we are and how we can move forward with it. Uh, one of the big headlines is uh, no lockouts through 2029. You know, so folks are you know really excited about being able to see the sport played, and and so congratulations on all of that. But let me let me um, get to you and the role you play in in all of this. I mean, if you read things about Tamika or if you talk to people about what is she like as a negotiator, you'll see you know focused, laser focused, relentless, brilliant. Tell me about, um, you know, a lot of people will come away from a negotiation and say, well, if everybody comes away feeling like they didn't get everything, they if everybody's unhappy, that's the definition of a, of a successful negotiation. Something tells me that's not the kind of thinker you are. Yeah. You look like a win, 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 win kind of person. And that's, that's good, yes. <laughs> I do like to win. Our players are competitive. I'm competitive too. But I have recognized that I am much better, just like most women on negotiating on behalf of other people, right? And it is about knowing your value. And I know the value of our players. They are the biggest asset. So when I look at, you know, people can talk all day about, you know, millionaires versus billionaires, et cetera. But the reality is when I look at a Michael Jordan who pays $275 million and now can sell it for $1.5 billion, it's sort of a no-brainer to me to want to think about Where's the piece of the pie for our players? How are they being able to actually benefit from the change and the growth in the marketplace? And so my perspective is very different. And when I see their value, that was sort of how I started the negotiation. When we think about growing the pie, I wanna grow the pie not only for the NBA, but I wanna grow the pie for our players too. And so my perspective was different in that regard. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, you know, it takes a village, and we had a chance to meet Inky San, who's in the audience. And by the way, Inky, thank you for all your help in preparing for, for this interview. And she didn't need to prepare you, though. You were good. I, I, well, you guys, yes. wow. Thank you, You're thank welcome. you, I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, the, you know, Inky was in the room until two in the morning, until four in the morning, you know, as, and you had teams of experts in various rooms deployed to go answer questions so that the people who have to make decisions, there's a, there's a ton of work that goes into this, and that requires a team. It requires a team. What I've heard is on, when you first joined the MBPA, and you came in, one of the things you did is walked in with cooking supplies, and you made potatoes and waffles for, for the team. 
I, I mean, you're my dream boss. Can I, <laughs> <laughs> can I just say? What, what, is this, what is this? Is this part of you? Is this? It, it, I mean, I think the best leaders live in service to others, right? And really, it was important to me to establish the relationship. And that's what it was about. And I will tell you all, aside from you know, doing that in the office, because I really do enjoy cooking. It's sort of my gift. And I remember a woman from Time Warner at one point said, you know, never become the mammy of the organization. Like, don't come across as being the motherly figure or, you know, all things feminine. And I thought, I'm going to be my authentic self. And I want to live in service to other people. But I think the biggest part of this is really recognizing sort of how we can give back and how we can do things differently. And so for me, that's what this was really about. Funny enough, and in fact, I don't know if anybody saw the New York Times article last week, but I remember I was on a Zoom call with Adam and I said, you know, I think we should play a little game. And he's like, he looks at me and he goes, you mean basketball? I go, no, field hockey, Adam. We should play a game. <laughs> I was like, I think that the NBA should play the PA in a little basketball game. And he was like, wow, like to him, the thought, we have a full court in our office, so if you're ever in Midtown, please come and visit us. And I said, you should come over and we should play a game. We could play pickleball, we could, and he, that to him, he was like, huh. Now, mind you, it took us like six months to get it on everybody's calendar. <laughs> but we got together and we had what we call a mixer and we played games. Now, Adam and I know our, our strengths and basketball was not one of them. And so we did the egg toss, you know, and of course he lost, but we did that. <laughs> yeah, the, the New York Times says that um, it, the jury is still out, but I'm gonna tell you, we won. <laughs> we have lots you of great retired players <laughs> on our team that were playing and, you know, the end you know, buzzer beater was Malik Rose and Mario West, like going at it at the very end and we oh. won. Wouldn't so, you love to be yeah. in that room? But it really it was about sort of developing that relationship, right? And that is unheard of because they're used to sort of fighting. The interesting thing about this is being an expert witness and you know testifying at trials, et cetera, for so long, you walk away and you truly walk away. In a CBA negotiation, Adam and I had to talk on Monday, right? So I couldn't be in a position where I was going to, you know, because we, were, we have a business to run. We've got things that we've got to get done. So for me, establishing the relationship first was critically important. It's the same with this. I, I, I see people across the room taking notes about their, preparing for their next negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> I love the egg toss. You got it? <laughs> <laughs> Spoon races. Um, Three-legged race. Yes. The uh, fantastic ideas. I have so many things to ask you. Um, I, let me, let me, I'll, I'll come to sort of wrap up my part of it and the audience needs to get ready and Paxton, I'm coming to you. Uh, the, uh, the, I, I looked at your press releases. You know, you just go to the NBPA media page and say, what are they talking about? And what I'm seeing is, yes, fantastic news about the CBA, but I'm also seeing things like there's a competition about whose merch is doing best and saw Steph Curry is leading the pack in terms of you know, jerseys. Uh, but I also see notes about technology. So uh, tell me about the role of technology in the world that you're dealing with now. Yeah, so it's interesting because I thought Deloitte was absolutely the best learning center because there was so much going on. I will tell you, being with our players and seeing the things that they're doing, the things that they're energized by, so, and we, are, we have to feed that, right? So when you think first about the fashion and design that you mentioned, we took our players to Milan last year, and they, we went to the SDA Bocconi School. We spent the week there, which is one of the top three business schools in Europe, and we spent a week there learning about sort of the businesses and developing a business, and we had the CEO of Dolce Gabbana and Stone Harbor and Missoni went out to their factory so that our players could sort of experience all of that because it's that important. We also know that our players are far ahead of most people because they know about technology, right? They get it. So we were using Web3 before others were. We were the first to bring out NFTs with Top Shot and actually utilizing that. So if you can imagine, I thought I was entering this world where I could sort of figure things out. And the first thing that Grant Williams asked me in an interview was, do you know the tax ramifications of cryptocurrency? And I was like, oh, I could ask Jeremy because I have no idea. <laughs> but they are in a very different space 
than yeah. we are. And so honestly, part of this is keeping up with them and keeping up with their ideas and their innovation and all the things that they want to get accomplished. I, I, I've, at Siemens, we've been working on the industrial metaverse. You know, the idea that this, oh, yeah. you know, we can actually augment the way we work and interact with the real world. Uh, do you think we're going to see the NBA in the metaverse? Well, our players reimagine everything. And we know we have to meet them where they are. And they are there. OK. So CJ McCollum has said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years you see our players in the metaverse. I really wouldn't. Exciting, exciting. You know, uh, this, this, well, I think I'm going to save my last question till after we've had a bit of dialogue. And yeah, Jeffrey, can we start to have some microphones moving around the room? Because this is, this is a room much that's going to have a ton <laughs> of questions. Paxton, I'm calling on you first. Barbara, thank you. Uh, Tamika, good to see you again, sister. Thank you. Always a blessing. Uh, you have a graduation coming up with some players who've been in the league for quite some time, particularly LeBron and Chris Paul. So uh, walk us through life after they, after their active careers are over. Yeah, so first of all, they are both so engaged with the union and the things that we are doing. I mean, Chris and I talk constantly, right? And, you know, whether it's a ref issue, whether it's a player issue, whatever that is. And so I think the biggest thing about them in particular is that they have done such a great job in developing other players. And that's become what's so critical. And so I don't think this is a news flash for anybody, but the one and done for us was significant, right? Because we want to make sure that we have these veteran players that we're bringing the players along. And that's exactly what Chris and LeBron have done. So they have their successor who will take on that role for them. You know, there'll be someone that'll be looking after Wembe. You know, we have a new player that'll be coming from France who is supposed to be the new or biggest thing since LeBron or Michael Jordan. By Jordan's, biggest, right? you mean tallest? You all, all of the above. <laughs> He could play. Yeah. They, they've sort of gotten now, particularly in Europe, and we have 25% of our players that are international. Yeah. They are, they have sort of no position. They can play any position. Typically, we come, you come in and you learn you were the point guard, you were the center. Like they can navigate that space. And so while they'll teach us a lot, we have a lot to teach them. And I think LeBron and Chris really focus on that, as well as some of our, our veteran players who do that as well. Great. Thanks for Thank the question. You. Yes. Here. Uh, good afternoon. Wait, let's wait for a microphone because we want to make sure that we get all it's of it. It's nice to see Paxton here. I only see him like Super Bowl, Final Four. Oh, yeah, you know, where the action is. <laughs> I don't usually need a microphone. In fact, my family says I talk too loudly, so um, I'm happy to use one. We all knew in this region that you would go on and do wondrous things, and um, all of us are so proud of your ascent and your accomplishments. Uh, my question is uh, this. How do, do the players think about NIL money? And how do G League players think about NIL money? And does a NIL money blur or diminish those who are coming into the league because college players want to extend their college career? In, in some cases, NIL money is more than G League salaries. So have any thought on that? Yeah, in most cases, right? So NIL, name, image, and likeness, and obviously our players now have the ability to do that you know, at a very, very young age. And so what that means actually is a really good thing, right? Because you know, a lot of people go to see college games. We just finished March Madness, right? And those players, this is a way for them to be rewarded for their hard work and to receive that earlier on. So what that does do is it changes the playing field for a lot of us, right? So when it was really, you want to get players into the NBA right out of high school or at 18 years old, now you don't, there's not that angst to see that happen because one, they can join the G League, two, they could be receiving funds from their NIL, three, they really have all of these options that are before them that they could really be engaged in. That was something that was unheard of before NIL. So I think that it's actually a great thing. The reality is, however, that when you join the league, it all goes into the league, right? And so what we can't have is that we, when we have a group licensing, we need our players to all be focused and functioning as a group. That's how we grow this brotherhood. That's how we become stronger as a union. That's how we can say no when we don't want things to happen to our union, is that we have to grow that. So understanding the transition, I think, will be what's significant for us, because the group licensing comes into effect immediately when you join the NBA. Thank you. Tom has a question. Yay, one of our players. 
Well, congratulations to a University of Maryland System grad Thank you. law school and University of Baltimore. Uh, you know, it's funny, when I left the NBA at age six, the minimum salary, was, as Phil would know, was 30000 today. It was close to a million bucks. It's amazing. Uh, in that equal, in that same period of time, uh, the number of our youth that were eligible to serve in the military was was very high. Today, 80% of our youth are unfit to serve in the military, either because of drugs, uh, overweight, unfit. And you know, one of the things I really think is important for NBA players to do because there's nothing more important in national security for our country, is to encourage our young people to be active, to not just watch, but to engage. And mm -hmm. it is so important for our country that we turn that, we turn that around so that you know, more than 50% of our country, young people could be fit to serve in their country, not 80% are unfit right now. Mm -hmm. So just something to think about. No, and I, I do appreciate you saying that. I will tell you that our players are very, as you know, very focused on wellness and not only wellness for themselves, but the lessons that they are teaching their children and in their community. So they spend a lot of time like talking about nutrition. They spend a lot of time talking about rest. I had no idea how serious they are about rest. I remember sort of saying to CJ one day, like, you know, tell me about sort of what you do to prepare for the games, et cetera. And he said, well, it actually starts the night before because that has become critical to their success and they recognize the importance of taking naps and they recognize the importance of what they put in their bodies. Like, Can I quote that you on that, important. by the yes. way? Yes. 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 And so I think that they are sort of teaching different lessons and they are role models for so many of our children, right? And so for them to continue to push that is, is definitely not lost to me. I appreciate you saying that. Mm -hmm. Good. Additional questions? I'm Hi, Tamika. Um, most of the media focuses on the negotiation between the owners and the players' union. Um, I think that you are at a disadvantage. You've done a terrific job, by the way. Thanks for all of the players that you did that. Um, I think you're at a disadvantage because your constituency is so big, and people tend to think the players are always a unified force. But you have people who are young or older who are going to earn the minimum and the maximum, and you have all of us who are in your ear all the time. Could you just talk a little bit about how you keep your constituency aligned so that you have a unified voice when you're speaking to the owners? Because it's not easy to do. It is not easy to do. So, um, and we did spend a lot of time doing that as we came up to the end of the negotiation. So, you know, from a media perspective, we go through their talking points, what they're supposed to say, the things that they are limited from saying. So, you know, as we talked about structure earlier today, within the union, we have an executive committee. So there are nine members that make up the union from that perspective. So that's, you know, three of whom sit on Boston Celtics, Malcolm, your nephew obviously being one of them. And so they spend like, every, I mean, I feel so bad for them. I have no idea how they played a game this season and helped with this negotiation. I was talking to them at 11.30 on Friday night. Like, are you sure we can do this? What do you think about this? But they spend so much time on that. And then you have their board of player reps, which is one player from each of the teams. And so they are the avenue to go back to all of the players to tell them what we should be saying. You know, what are the things that are most important? What messages do we want to get out there? Because again, they are influencers, right? Their following is so large. And so when it comes to like getting things out or not getting things out, we have to do that. Unfortunately or fortunately, we have 450 individual players. And so what that means is that they're all going to have their perspective and we want to encourage them again to be their authentic self. So the naysayers are absolutely going to be out there and they're going to have an opinion on how things need to work or shouldn't work. The reality is, as you can think about, you know, what do you have to do? You gotta sort of play to what's best for everyone and you can't help but to come into something of like, what does this mean to me? 
right? And so making sure that they are focused on the brotherhood and not just focused on themselves is critical. But to your point around stakeholders, you have agents, you have coaches, you have leagues, you have governors. There are so many people that we're playing to every single day. It's hard to make sure everyone is happy. And I know I'm a people pleaser. And so sometimes that's hard to sort of back up and say, you know what? there's going to be one or two or someone that's going to say something differently. So I'm learning that and I'm learning that now too, the hard way, but it's been interesting. Uh, there may be a lesson in this for what we're going through as a nation, right? This is the great American experiment. Mm -hmm. We work together and we build a bigger pie and we organize in a lot of different ways in order to get things done. But we're kind to one another while we're doing this. You don't have to yeah. leave people with no dignity and respect, right? Love it. So that's what you always I think do. we can learn a lot from, from watching what you've accomplished um, in your negotiations. I, I want to check and make sure that I give others the chance to ask questions. Uh, full disclosure, I am a South Carolina Gamecock. <laughs> and, and proud of that. Uh, the women's tournament was oh, thrilling. Glad this you year, asked. Is all I can say. And I'm sorry that our guys lost. Don Staley's an incredible coach, etc. But they finish college, and then you have the WBA, mm -hmm. and and the, the disparity, the discrepancy, obviously is is quite obvious, and, and maybe it's permanent. But what advice do you have? I mean, how can you actually grow the women's game? In my opinion, this way basketball used to be played. This is, it is an incredible. You said great. it, I didn't say it. Yeah, so, so <laughs> what, what, what do you do about that or do you have any advice for your counterpart on yeah, that? So it really great question and thank you for mentioning that because our women are just some of the greatest players. In the I world. mean, we saw highest viewing ever for a women's game. We saw excitement that was through the roof. Yes, yes, and everybody recognizes, even you know, given what occurred with BG and uh, you know being outside of the U.S. for so long, we don't want that, right? We don't want our players feeling like the only way they can make a living is to do it outside of the U.S. when they are so passionate about a sport. So first of all, as a union, we support the W as well. So their off offices are within our offices. Our men are adamant about being able to support them and making sure that they have what they need. I'm not going to, you know, steal any thunder on the news because the full term sheet will come out on hopefully Monday or Tuesday of next week, but we are focused on how we can help grow the game for them, right? And so we are looking at, you know, issues around chartered flights. We're looking at issues around, you know, mental health for our players, their salary and compensation. So that's something that we're all all hands in on. And as a union, and as our 450 players, it's first and foremost to us. They are on our agenda at all of our meetings. It is something that they have made a priority. And you'll see some different things coming out as a result of it. That's exciting. I have heard you talk about the global aspect of basketball. Mm -hmm. And the, I've heard you hint that you see a lot of opportunity. Give us a picture of ideas that you have for, for the globe. It is, it, it's, it's really amazing. First of all, I don't know if, if you all know, but we host global games as well. So part of our season this year, we were in Japan and we were in Abu Dhabi and we were in Mexico, we were in Paris. And seeing the fan engagement in all of these places is very different. So first of all, I'm delighted I see so many women here. I will also say in Japan, the biggest fans are female. Yes. So when we showed up there and they had, you know, the bigger jerseys and the women were like, this is not going to work because I need like t-shirts that cut off here and you know all these things because it is a different dynamic right so playing to a different audience is huge for us but also appreciating how much the game impacts the community so Africa is a place that we will be spending a significant amount of time and making significant investments in it will be a game changer for the community more broadly I mentioned to you that 25% of our players here in the NBA are international and so the things that they're doing from a philanthropic perspective are not just here in the US. They're looking at building one of our players, Biz, who's on the EC, he's building a hospital in Congo because his father couldn't get to the hospital when he was sick. Like those are the things that you're seeing that our players are doing globally. It's, wow. It will definitely be a game changer. And I think the biggest expansion that we'll see in the NBA will come from outside of the US. Fascinating. Mara or Jeffrey, or is there anyone else who has a question? Oh. 
<laughs> Let's hear from Gina, yeah, please, and then Gina. we'll hear a <laughs> funny question. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right, great. First of all, this is such an inspiring, fun interview. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Janika. Thank this you. is really fun. So, um, Tamika, you just seem so perfect for this job, and I'm thrilled to see you in it. What surprised you the most about taking this position on? Great question. Yeah, I think probably there have been many things. Um, I think what surprised me the most is how little people knew about our players and about the compassion that they have off the court. And you know, as you all know, when I was at Deloitte and I had taken on this role in 2017, it was a really challenging time here, and I really tried to focus on kindness and you know, seeing Deloitte as this kind place, right? And I realized that the world that they live in is not always kind. Um, and that has been challenging. It's awful to watch. I realize that the world now that I have embarked upon is also not very kind. You know, I hadn't thought that I would ever need security or that there would be threats or that, you know, someone said to me recently, I, I remember um, during the Sarver investigation and, you know, I, I made a comment that he just, you know, could not be here. And oh my gosh, you would have thought that the rest of the world would have agreed with me, but instead there were all these awful comments and I remember telling you know, friends, girlfriends, like can you believe they said I was like in tears on the train coming back from New York to DC because people were so mean and they said, you're not supposed to read the comments. I was like, well why should somebody have told me not to read the comments? <laughs> <laughs> but and our players have gotten to the point where they are learning like don't read the comments and so we put out a, um, a sort of a white paper probably six months ago now where we showed the negative social media that's out there and how hard it is to get things down I mean I spent two weeks ago I was on the call with Twitter my god there was like no one there that we knew from before I had to call Deloitte and say could you find somebody tell them to take that down but when you think about like the things that are being said it's it can be really harsh and I had not appreciated I mean it, it looks so like you know pink and roses up there for them. But the reality is it's a really hard job and people don't look at them wow. as human beings. Fathers, you know, they have children, they have spouses, they have mothers, fathers, and they're just, you know, they aren't considering them that way. And that to me has been a shock and surprising because we all see the glory side of most of this and it, it's really hard. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And thanks, great question, Gina. Let's. Let do you have a funny question? Yeah. <laughs> I knew your predecessor really well, who was a spitfire trial lawyer who I got to try a case or two with back in the day. And you're different from that, even though you had a lot of experience with litigation when your old job. But one of the coolest things about your job is your office space. And I know Michelle had a lot to do with that. And I don't think everyone here knows what your office space is like, but can you tell us about your office space? Yeah what you have in there for the players, how it came to be, and more importantly, where it is. Well, I'm not going to let you tell them where it is. Okay. So it is basically right in Times Square. So we're on between on six, right between 43rd and 44th. And I, I am so proud of our office space. I always tell people to come up. We should have our next round table in New York on the court. But we do have a full court there, which I love. We have hot tub. We have cold tubs. We have running treadmills in the water there. And I was like, God, I didn't even imagine this. And I was thinking to myself, I'd be doggy paddling. And then someone said to me, no, Tamika, they actually lift it up. <laughs> 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 so it is really a fantastic space in the heart of Midtown, right? No one thinks that you come into an office building and then you walk into this space and our players are going in and out throughout the day and, you know, they're coming in to do shoot around. So it's a fun place. And when you're there trying to focus on the work and, you know, Steph comes and he sits at the front of your desk, you're like, oh, okay, well, I guess it's now time to have this conversation or whomever may be running through the office. So it's a great space. I would encourage you to visit, please. Well, so Mary, let's talk about maybe a joint meeting with the Economic Club of New York. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's fantastic. All I know everybody's got pent up questions, but but I actually let me let me draw this to a close. Tamika Tremalio, you are amazing. Can I just? 
Many, many in this room know that um, I'm also, in my spare time, the host of a podcast called The Optimistic Outlook. And I love to ask people, first of all, whether they are optimists. And then it, I, when, you, when you meet someone who is at the top of their game in, in an area, in a field that maybe others of us don't know, I'd love to hear your vision. If you're able to accomplish what you have on your agenda, what does the world look like for the rest of us? So I am an eternal optimist, right? I wake up every day with a sense of gratitude, and so I can't imagine not being happy, right? Um, the world for me, particularly for our players, is a world that gives them more business opportunities, that's focused on their future and what they will do, and then one that really protects them and their safety. So that's what I want to see. That's where we have been spending most of our time. So that's what I'd like the world to look like in the metaverse. Oh, okay, in the metaverse. <laughs> we want to live in that world with you. You all, on behalf of the Economic Club of Washington, I am so pleased to give you a gift to help Going you remember. Office. And I think there's a certain basketball court that has the perfect spot for this. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh, that's great. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you very much.